neuro-linguistic programming, for anybody that doesn't know, because I always start it from the basis of knowing nothing, which is pretty much how I start most of my days as well, um, is the study of the way the mind works, how we take in and process information, how that information comes and becomes our version of our reality, and how we see the world uniquely based on our memories, our values, our beliefs, the way that we're filtering the information that's coming into us. And then that map, that model, that reality comes out through our language, our body language, our verbal language, and that language and the way that we communicate our behaviours give a bit of a clue about what's going on in our thought processes. And also the P bit, the program and the patterns. It's all about the patterns and programs that we operate in our life. And some of those patterns are really empowering and amazing. And other patterns can be a little bit maybe disempowering and not quite so useful. So NLP for me is about the study of the way that we're taking information uniquely, how that comes out through our communication and our behaviours to other people. And then also the way that we can recognise and become maybe a little bit more emotionally intelligent about what's going on with our thinking. And part of NLP is also about owning your stuff. It's about going, do you know what? I thought that thought. I got that emotion. I did that thing that created this thought process within me. And I've got to be able to recognize that. And also, if I want to change it and shift it, I know that I can change my mind really easily. And so the, a lot of the NLP processes give you the ability to start shifting your mindset. And so if any of you out there have also done things like CBT, uh, mindfulness, um, another other sort of processes that are come from similar roots, because NLP comes from soci uh, sociology, psychology, um, the study of uh, neuroscience. NLP comes from a lot of similar routes to a lot of the other cognitive um, thought process thinking. And if any of you have read things like the Chimp Paradox and uh, have gone to anything to do with Tony Robbins, uh, or you've seen um, the likes of Darren Brown operate or uh, Paul McKenna, they're, they're all NLP trainers for, for a start. Um, McKenna and Brown and uh, Robbins, are, they're all trained in NLP. Um, and they're also about the study of the mind and how we are brilliant at doing some things and not so good at doing others. So what I wanted to do today was to kind of get cracking straight into the concept of one of the areas of NLP. And I kind of put this meeting as being about, with all the stuff going on around coronavirus and lockdown and isolation and all the things that we've got going on, and also all the shifts and changes to maybe what we thought we were going to end up having, you know, going to be doing with our June and how that's completely been turned upside down. What I thought I'd do this evening is go through a really interesting process. It's all about working either with a problem that you've got that you'd like to solve or an outcome, something you would like to have happen. And this process is called the Disney strategy. And so I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, just before I do that, I'm just going to mute everybody. Hang on. Just so I don't get the background chatter. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here. So the Disney strategy. The Disney strategy was a strategy that was developed by um, a guy called Robert Diltz. And Robert Diltz studied the work of the Disney Imagineering team and Walt Disney himself. And it's brilliant technique to allow you to work creatively. What do I mean by working creatively? Well, I guess what I mean is when you want to tap into that inner brilliance that you have, like your ability to solve problems sometimes but not others, you know, for some in some respects where you have a bounce back ability and other times you don't, or maybe you've got a project or something you've got coming up where you want to make an achievement and really get to grips with something that's happening. It's also great for teams. Uh, it's also great for environments where you want to get creative and for self coaching. So all of the stuff that we're going to go through today, I have is a little, a one page handout and the little ebook um, that if you private message me your email address, just during this talk, I can make sure that I send that to you separately. Because on Meetup, I don't get your email addresses or anything else. So you need to let me have that in order for me to just send you through the details about this. Um, and so what are we going to cover? We're going to look at the Disney strategy, why it's important to take different perspectives, what each of the four different points of view are within that Disney strategy, um, and a bit of a case study. This is going to be one that involved a team, but also I use this an awful lot with all the coaching clients that I have, particularly when I'm working remotely with people as well, because it's a great one to do via remote working. So... It was inspired by the work of Walt Disney because one of the people that worked with Walt said that he always used to say that there was actually three different Walts that walked into the room. There was the dreamer, the realist, and the spoiler. 
and you never quite knew which one was coming into a meeting. And what was really interesting was Walt Disney was amazing at being able to get projects off the ground, to be able to get things operating. You know, imagine just coming up with this idea of putting this great big fantasy theme park, you know, in the middle of nowhere, and you're going to get characters walking around to a great big castle, come up with all these big ideas. And so Walt Disney was brilliant at getting projects off the ground and up and running. So much so that they actually created the Disney Imagineering team. And the Imagineering team was first conceptualized in the 40s and later created as the team itself. And it was a blend of imagineering and imagination, sorry, and engineering. And so basically they are now the R&D team of Walt Disney Corporation. So if you look up Disney Imagineering, they, they exist, they have job roles, you can go and apply to work there. And they're basically in charge of the theme parks, the construction of everything. They're in charge of the corporate side of Walt Disney. And they follow the principles of Disney strategy on creative projects. So that's why I thought it was a really interesting thing to share with you because the Disney strategy was created by studying Walt Disney by a guy called Robert Dills, as I said earlier. Now, NLP is founded on modeling. So the founders of NLP, Richard Bandler and John Grinder, modeled the people that they saw were brilliant at things when they founded NLP. So they modeled Milton Erickson for his hypnotic language. They modeled Virginia Satir for her ability to work in a therapy point of view to get really down to the detail that was happening within people. They um, studied Gregory Bateson about his work in terms of how do we learn and how do we think. Uh, they studied Gestalt theory to look at how do we store our past and how do we work with our younger self, the stories we tell ourselves. And so they modeled and created the field of NLP by studying excellence in other people. And that's exactly what Diltz did back in the 80s when he created the Disney strategy. And so Disney strategy is all about taking different points of view when it comes to either a problem or an outcome. So that's what I'm going to get you to do first of all. So on your piece of paper, and if you still haven't gone and got one, I would suggest that you go and go and get one. So I would like you to write down a problem that you have that you haven't yet solved or something that you would like to have happen. I'm deliberately saying that, like to have happen. I don't want you to write down what you don't want. You know, I don't want to not have a job. Now, that's a negative, right? Your brain cannot process a negative. So in order to not think about something, it has to think about it. So I want you to set positive intention. Or it sets something that goes towards an outcome or a goal or will fix a problem for you. So what is it you would like to have happen? That's the first thing. And when you've got that, pop it into the chat. Let me know what kind of things you've got that have been coming up. So let me just pop the chat up so I can actually see it without the screen. And thank you for your emails that have been coming in. And oh, Priya, you did a Udemy course. Awesome. We've got the course on Udemy. I wonder if it was our one. <laughs> So Farzin, you want to live more in the now. Okay, that's a little bit amorphous. Not quite, I can't quite get my hands on that one. So what do you mean by living more in the now? Do you mind just sharing a little bit more about that? You're muted at the moment, mate. Let me unmute, uh, saying, hang on. I stopped you from being able to unmute yourself. Right, go for it. Uh, yeah, okay, cheers. Uh, so probably not being as, as consumed as, as consumed in my thoughts and being more in the, the reality that's unfolding in front of me. Okay, and when you are in that reality of what's unfolding around you, what difference will that make for you? Peace. Peace. Okay. So is it that you'd like to have more peace? Yes. And that having more peace means for you living more in the now? Yes. Yeah. Unless they're nice thoughts, which they tend to be as much. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. Okay. So I would suggest you write peace down as the, as the outcome. Um, so Geraldine, yep, being open to starting a relationship. Awesome. Uh, Bill, when will I retire? Uh, good question. When will you retire? Uh, that's not, again, that's not quite tangible. So what is the real tangible element to it? Because it's more of a question. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out um, whether it would be in the next three months, six months, eight months, a year that I'm, I'm planning on retiring. I just haven't set the date yet. Okay. Is that a good enough question for this exercise? So if the outcome was I'm going to retire... And maybe right. the process gave you maybe part of the when. Would that be useful? Yes. Okay, cool. So I would suggest that I'm, I am retiring mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and work that as your outcome. Brilliant. Great. Um, so what else have we got here? We've got, um, okay, so Juliet, so more into your healing work and out of your corporate work. Um, again, more out of. It's kind of like it's an evolving process. So what specifically would be your outcome? If you could name, nail one outcome down, what would that be for you, Julia? 
um, to ha be able to have the, um, I guess, the resources and finances to set up my own business. Okay. So setting up the business. Yeah. Okay. So I would suggest that, again, you work with that as the overall goal, that I have my business set up. Okay. Yeah. So again, we want to, we want to get your goal not to the process of doing, we want to get it to it having been done. Yeah. It's important that your goal is it having achieved. So Geraldine, that you are in a relationship. Yeah. Um, uh, Magdalena, uh, hello. Um, so for you, um, Magdalena, I would suggest it's when you have more confidence in your skill set, what will that achieve for you? Yeah. Oh, it's Magda, isn't it? Sorry. It's because you come on, you've come on for your computer instead. <laughs> um, so Catherine as well, more confident to go in and get challenged. So again, I would suggest that you think of the outcome as being more confident in conversations or something along those lines, whether or not it's being challenged or, or not to set your outcome as that kind of end result. Uh, okay. Candice, more motivated and confident. Awesome. Um, Elias, setting and implementing a clear goal. Cool. So I would like you to set and implement a clear goal now about a goal you would like to achieve. Yeah. You've given me, you've given me something about a goal to do with your goal. So what, what specifically could you aim for right now? Um, basically right now is basically practicing NLP. And, uh, okay. Yeah. And for, and for, for what purpose? Um, for purpose of uh, basically uh, improving myself in, in all areas related to business relationships and, and so on. Okay. And when you yeah. and when you improve yourself in all those areas in communication and everything else, what would that give you? What will you be able to do with that? Uh, I'll be able basically uh, to improve my performance, I guess, and okay. uh, get yeah get better. Um, for example, grow my business and. So be more confident. Cool. So I would stick with something like improve my business because improving your business, you can even put a number to it. You could put a, a, a clear goal, getting more clients, doing more work, coaching more people or coaching X number of people. So think of what's a clear goal that if you could go right tick, I've achieved that because I've set myself a really clear goal. What would that clear goal be? And that goes for all of you. So rather than being, I would like to be, or I'm in the process of what is the clear goal? Maru, what have you got for you? What's your clear goal? Do you mind sharing? I've typed it in the chat. Oh, sorry, I missed it. I said I'd like to have uh, the social, my social media content completed for the a whole month in advance. Okay, so again, for what purpose? For what purpose? For what purpose? I didn't understand the question. For what purpose? So you're doing, you're doing social media content. Is yeah. it why? Oh, okay. For my I, know, I, know, I know we didn't ask why in NLP, but why? <laughs> for my business. For my business. To achieve what? Um, so that I can feel more in control of the process. Okay. So for your business to feel more in control. So is it to expose yourself to X number more clients? Is it to get X more yeah. business? So yeah. I think about that around the tangible goal. Right. Yeah. Okay. The setting, the setting the scope. Okay. Um, and so for everybody else, just think about what is a clear goal? What could, is there something I could put numbers to? Is there something I could put an amount to? Uh, is it something that I can achieve? Is it about getting a new promotion, getting a new love, getting a new um, X number of clients? So just think about what is the goal that you could achieve? Okay. Uh, yep, Michael. Excellent. So a specific number. Yeah. Weigh that amount by Christmas. Brilliant. Okay. So once you've got that scope and you know a little bit more, you set up your coaching business. Absolutely. So once you set the scope, then it's about, right, what information as an outsider do I have that I can get tangible information from? So if I looked at what was going on for my goal as an outsider, how could I see that? Now, it might be that you don't really have anything for this, or it might be that your business, you can actually think of, right, here's my profit and loss. Here's the number of clients I've been seeing per month at the moment. Here's the feedback I've been receiving from clients. Yeah. Uh, here's the uh, relationships that have worked and not worked for me. Uh, so 
as an outsider, just write down at the moment, what sort of things would the outsider see? If they were coming in and analyzing, consulting, um, acting as an external, external observer, no, put my teeth in, an external observer to your goal, is there any tangible bits of information that you could use to say, actually, this is where I am against achieving it? Uh, if it's about saving money or changing uh, careers, if it's about moving house, you know, I have saved this much or I am that much in debt still. You know, so what are the tangible amounts? Doesn't matter. This is factual information. There's no judgment on it. There's not where you are, where I want to be. Yeah, it's what is the information that you can gather right now that is factual as an outsider. Okay. And you don't spend very much time here. Um, if you were doing this as a team, as a team, you would look at, right, what's the feedback that we've received from uh, within the organization or from our patients or um, whatever it happens to be? What problems do we know that exist within the business that can be seen from the outside? What's our reputation like? Um, what's our KPIs and uh, profit loss accounts? And, you know, all the, the key things that we can have as numbers, that's what you would normally put into here. So just take a moment to note these down. You don't spend very long here, but just long enough to just gather the information. You don't have to put that into the chat if you don't want to. Uh, okay, so good question um, that's just come in. So is it the outside looking at tangible measures right now or the time we achieve it? It's right now. So looking at it right now as opposed to when you achieve it. So what we're looking at here is what's your markers for success or your markers for as a starting point? So if it's I want to grow my business, right? Go right. At the moment, my business in, is invoicing £800 a month. £2,000 a month, £10,000 a month, yeah? Um, if it's I'm going in a relationship, I want to be in a relationship, maybe it's I'm chatting to five people in a month or no people in a month, or I've had two relationships in the last six months. Whatever the numbers are, just think of what the facts are right now. It's really important just right now as the outsider. If we were to come and fact check your goal, um, and it's only for you to know this bit of information. Now, after we've done this process, we've gotten the facts, we've gotten the information, what we then want to do is step into the next part of the process. And this is the brilliant one. This is the dreamer. Now, the dreamer is actually where the creativity starts. Because they, what you want to do is connect with that dream of passion and enthusiasm. And I'm going to presuppose that each of you right now can remember a time, if you were to think of it at this moment in time right now, you could think of a time when you've been able to dream big dreams. You know, when you've been able to get, uh, really think about uh, that moment you got inspired by a project and created it and made it happen. It could have been going on holiday to a particular place or you know, building something and creating it. It could have even been when you were much younger and you thought, do you know what, I'm just going to go and do this thing and then you made it happen. I want you to connect to that version of you right now, that dreamer. It doesn't matter how long ago it was or how recent it might have been. I want you to think, when was I able in the past to make things happen as that dreamer? To just go for it. Leaving aside all the shite that might be happening right now, you know, and any of the other thought processes that are happening to you now, I want you to reconnect to the dreamer. And in this first space, without any restrictions, criticisms, anything else holding you back, what is the dream? What is the big picture? If you could make this absolutely happen, this outcome that you've written, what would the big picture give you? What would that dream give you? What would it make for you? What would it create in your life? What if? What if it went so well that it was amazing? Do you know, I would imagine that when Walt Disney was creating the concept of the first theme park, the people would have gone, are you sure? But he put all that to one side. In this space, I want you to be the dreamer. And what is the vision if it goes really well? What will you be seeing, hearing and feeling when this thing goes amazingly? How do you imagine that solution might go, might be like, might feel like? When you're absolutely working at your best, loving it at your best, being at your best, when you're confident at your best, whatever it is for you, what is the big dream? Go really big, go bigger than that. Because we need to start to program our minds to go towards goals. When we're going through the process of goals and dreams and thinking. 
we need to make sure our brains are being programmed. We have these thought processes and if we start programming ourselves towards something, we start to notice opportunities. We have this area of the brain, the reticular activating system, and it starts to notice stuff. This is the part of the brain that when you buy a car, suddenly you see that car everywhere. Or when you have a thought process about, oh, do you know what, I need to go and get my guitar fixed. And you suddenly start seeing guitar shops everywhere. Or you notice guitars on every piece of social media post. It's that area of the brain that notices things. And if we start setting the dream unconsciously in our head, it starts allowing you to notice opportunity. So what is the big dream? Ignore the shite. We're going to come to the critic later and the realist and the planner. What is the big dream? And what's the benefits to you of a this situation? And also, how is it important to you? When you've achieved this, what would it give you in your life? What would it be the big dream for you right now? And just write anything else down that comes to mind about that dream. If anybody would like to share, just wave. It's optional. <laughs> if you'd like to share, I'd love to just hear a little bit example of what you've got. Buzzing. Sharing the, I don't know where to share in the chat or not. Um, okay, so totally present guy, um, happy and peaceful at the same time, saw the best in people, had a beautiful and lovely wife, um, and just really enjoyed hanging around with people and, and actually wanted to be in social situations and, and have fun. Awesome. And for you, all of that is achieving that goal and beyond, the big yeah. dream. Awesome. And what would that do for you when you are there and you have all of that? Like extreme happiness and fulfillment. Brilliant. That's the right level of dream. That's the one we wanted. Definitely. <laughs> I don't want you to just check in. Do you have that really big oh, sense of this would be just absolutely flipping amazing if I had this? Yeah, that's the kind of level of dream I want. Not just, it would be quite nice if. Yeah, I want the mind blowing, like, wowness factor for that dream. So just double check in with that. Okay. Now, then what we do is I want you to take one element of that dream. Now, if you're working, by the way, with a team, then what you would do is you would actually put these different elements into different post-it notes. You do different compartments. You would do different things to write down all these dreams. If you were brainstorming this, you'd put it onto a flip chart with different post-it notes with lots of information going down onto that board. You would put all those big dreams down so that you're able to then catalog them and find out information later. And so once you've got that dream out of your head or the team have got that dream up, what you then really do is pick an element of the dream to work on next. So I want you to think, what, what is one tangible thing that you can start to work towards right now? And then what we're going to do is we're going to step into the next stage of the strategy. We're going to go into the realist. Now, the realist is the planner. Again, we're going to come to the critic, the spoiler later. So as the planner, it's more of a logical thinking style. And it's about narrowing down the ideas of the dreamer so you can get it to like a constructive shortlist. And typically you take the single best idea. Yeah, and then you start to work on that. So during this stage, you would ask questions of yourself like, right, how can you apply this idea in reality? So within that one element, what can you do to start making it a reality? What's the action plan that you would start to apply this idea? What's the timeline? How would you evaluate it? What are the tangible things where you would know how it might happen? Now, traditionally, what we would do from an NLP sense, if we were looking at outcomes and how to work to outcomes, we would ask ourselves a whole load of questions. There's a brilliant outcome setting tool that we use within NLP that we teach on the practitioner course about setting outcomes, um, looking at what would it be like if I achieve that outcome? What would it be like if I didn't achieve it? What wouldn't it be like if I did achieve it? Or what wouldn't it be like if I didn't achieve it? So actually, we look, at th we look at the outcome from four different points of view. So within your outcome, you can look at your outcome. Uh, good, Aaron, how do you know if it's realistic? Now, we're going to come to that next. Because okay? your spoiler, your critic may have some ideas about that one. Um, 
the thing is though, is to start to recognize what the timeline is. The other part of the process that's really interesting within, um, from an NLP perspective is if we actually set ourselves an outcome. So let's say that this over here is now. And over here is my goal. And what I'm trying to do is navigate my way along to my goal, but I get, I'm, I'm going to kind of end up getting a bit lost along the way. A good way when you're trying to find out how to get from now to a goal is actually to start going backwards. So within NLP, what we would normally do is look at the goal. We might make it smart, you know, specific, measurable, realistic, timely, achievable. I missed out the A. Um, so once we set a goal, we might make it like, what's that going to be like, feel like, really act like. But then what we would do traditionally within an NLP perspective within goals is actually step backwards. So we start with the end in mind. You go, right, for that end goal to happen, what has to happen for that to happen? What's the main tangible thing that has to happen for that goal? Then we might go, right, what has to happen for that to happen? And then what has to happen for that goal to happen? And so forth. And so we end up with a series of little stepping stones that go backwards towards that main goal. And Erin, then usually what I find if we start that way, you know, because you'd have to put an end result to this goal. Let's say it's in one year's time. Yeah, and then this might be at month 10. This one might be at month eight. And then this one's at month seven. And you go to this one being month six, but actually suddenly you recognize, oh no, I can't do that month six. I can't actually do that one until seven or eight. You go, okay, that's fine. So I can actually then reevaluate these and go, right. So this is probably going to be um, yeah, one year plus two months. They go, that could be one year, then that's at 11 months, and then that's at 10. Now I can do this one at eight. The great thing about doing this with this process is that you suddenly recognize where the critical paths are. You recognize where you need to spend a bit of time working on particular elements. So as a realist, as that planner, what are the elements that you need to have achieved in order to get your big dream? One element of that big dream. Not say the entire thing, but a good step along the way. Because the next step is always the most important step to take. We kind of know that. But we get lost as to which of the next steps to take. So that's where this process can be really useful. So the question that we would ask yourself is what needs to happen for that goal to happen? And then, like I say, you'd work backwards along the stepping stones. So then you know that when you're suddenly ready to start to move forward from your now, you then know what's each of the things I need to achieve along the way then suddenly end up at my goal. And that's the idea of this NLP process. This is all about getting past those stepping stones and ending up at the goal. So then as the realist, that's where we start to ask ourselves those questions. How can we apply this idea in real life? Now, how can we make that happen? And that's where it's really important uh, that's, why it's, that's why it's really important to ask yourself these questions. So, yeah, you might not know the timeline yet, but do you know the steps, Erin? That's another important thing. Any questions about this stage at the moment, just before we move on to the next one? You can pop them in the chat or you can just ask them. It's either's fine. <laughs> I now have a new plant, by the way. That's what the banging at the door was. <laughs> It's just, isn't it hard like to realize, okay, that that's your goal, but I mean, do you have to be really aware of the steps and, and the actions that you've got to take and, and, the, and the, like the stages? Do you have to, is that essential? I'd say to have an awareness of what those stages and steps are, definitely. Because otherwise, how will you know you're getting there, Farzan? What's your check-in? If you are mapping out your goal, you know your end goal, you know it's all about peace for you yeah. and what that peace will give you, but how are you going to get peace? I mean, I could give you a, I can give you a piece. Here's a piece of paper clip. You know, what do you mean by piece? If, uh, I put here earlier when you were talking about tangible, I said like my thoughts. I, if I calculated numerically, how, how, what percentage of the day I'm thinking? It's ninety percent, but I suppose a realistic piece for me is to have fifty percent thoughts of day and not ninety percent. Okay. So therefore, you will know the things in your life. You don't have to share this part. But you will know the things in your life that are occupying the 40%. Yeah. yeah. 
which of the 40 percent you are feeling maybe are coming in that you don't need to have you would like to not have and those thoughts are probably around things you have in your life or that you're doing in your life or where you're working in your life or the relationship you're in or not in your life and so therefore you have an awareness of how to get those figures down if you're using a percentage from 90 percent down to 50 percent you will know what are the processes and the things that are occupying the extra space that doesn't allow peace to come in the other way of doing it by the way is allowing more peace so therefore the percentage will come down anyway rather than less thoughts but it's just a suggestion didn't think of that <laughs> <laughs> just another way of looking at it um yeah, that's good, eh? has everybody got something as that realist awesome good now the next part of the process is to then come on to stage number four if we look at it as the outsider you've got the outsider we've got the dreamer we've got the realist then what we have is the critic now the critic is the what if but if this happened then what would happen and so after going to the dreamer and going to the realist the critic is there to basically it's, it's your self-love it's your protection mechanism it's the part of your brain that will be kicking in anyway so we need to make sure we acknowledge and hear it yeah now if you're working as a team this is the con constructive criticism stage and particularly if you're working with a team i always say that the ideas that have come up with are the team's ideas, not your ideas personally. You never take things personally at this stage. You're critiquing the idea and not you. And do the same thing for yourself. You might think, oh, that idea is just a whole load of bunk up. Tried it before, blah, blah, blah. Right, yeah, that's your critic coming out. Write those thoughts down. What could be wrong with it? Okay, you've tried it before. But that was you in the past, not you now. Yeah? What support resources do you have now that you didn't have before? Now, what is missing that needs to be present and what is present that needs to be missing in order for those thoughts to happen are there any risks and dangers why can you not do it are there any weaknesses in the plan what are all the yeah buts you know that part of your brain that goes yeah but this this is why i haven't yet achieved it oh, i don't know enough oh i'm this i'm that i'm what's all the stuff that's going around in your head yeah and at the critic stage get it all out particularly in relation to the dream not just about you as a person but in relation to the dream, what are all the air buts that might come up? So if it's a relationship, I'll, I'll never meet the right person. Yeah, I'll never do this. I'll never be able to find out. I've tried it before, but it hasn't worked. But get all those things out of your head and get them down. Yeah, Aaron, so normally when you get to this stage, you tend to cancel the whole thing. Quite often, though, what happens is when people come up with a plan, they go into critic first. So therefore, quite often, because the dream is big enough and worth it, and then the realist starts to help start to plan it, the critic is actually critiquing the idea, not the dream. Now they're critiquing the particular element you've chosen, not the whole goal. So that's where often actually, if your critic is coming in, like the critic about the element you're working on within the realist plan. Yeah, does that make sense? And so, this is what the critic is there to do it's your protection mechanism that will already be there your unconscious mind one of its prime directives is to look after you yeah it's to protect you it does all that background function like breathing and beating your heart and you know thinking and reminding yourself and it's got the flight fight fornicate fear responses all those elements they're just kind of background things that happen but also it's doing and running patterns that protect you Having a phobia is a protection mechanism. Being fearful of something is a protection mechanism. Not wanting to do something because something in the past went really badly, it's a protection mechanism. So allow the critic to come up with all the reasons as to why it might not work. What might you lose? What might happen? And be honest, get them down. Because also when you get them outside of yourself, you write things down, you're externalizing it. It's like you become detached. In an NLP term, we would call it disassociated from that information. So therefore, you can review it with a little bit more of a kind of logical step back. And that's the next thing I'd like you to do, right? Is look at what you've written down and just step back from it. Literally, do it. Put it somewhere else or step back from it physically. Yeah, move that information away from where you've written down or move yourself. And now I want you to look at that information and go, right, what do I know now about my goal and my dream? As I look at that information I've got out in front of me, as I look at the stuff I've got down there now, 
What do I know about it? And is there any advice that I might give myself at any of those stages, the dreamer, the realist, or the critic? Because the final part of this process is then to start to cycle round between the different stages so you're cycling through the process. So what you then do is you go from critic back to realist. So the critic has come up with a whole lot of yeah buts, what ifs. So what advice then can the realist start to take into that process and then feed that back into the dream and just reevaluate the plan and the process? And then the dreamer might then revolve back around to the critic and you end up looping back around and cycling back around the action plan to just plan through the different stages. Now you need to allow for creativity to flow, and particularly if you're working with a team. And I've done this process with, as I'm going to say, you know, share with you in a bit, over like 30, 40 people at a time. It takes time to do this process. So you can allow yourself, particularly if you're self-coaching, uh, the time to be able to work your way through the process and give it the time that it really needs. You also now time for creativity. So for instance, if in order to be the dreamer, you need to not be in your house and you want to be outside in the fresh air or sat in your garden or in your local park or wherever it is that you can be creative and dreamy, go there and do that. Yeah, if your critic is the point where you, you know that actually you can be really critical when you're in this environment, go there and do it. You know, and your realist, your problem, your planner, yeah, go to the environment where you become your planner. Maybe it's the desk at which you work at for work. Um, so going and changing space and going to different environments can be really important and useful for this process as well. And so you cycle back round from the critic to the realist and you just check in on the dream until you get that refined idea of how you're going to make that goal happen. And the idea about this is to become really creative about the way that you achieve the goal. So what I'm going to do now because you guys have got something written down there, is I'm gonna pop you into breakout spaces. I'm gonna put you into groups of three. And within that breakout space, I would like you to just share with that group, what did you get from the process? What do you know now that you didn't know before? And what does that mean and make a difference to you for? And I mean, you're gonna do that in small spaces rather than then into this big environment. For those of you that haven't used breakout spaces before, this is gonna be interesting. Um, so let me just create. Uh, you could be in groups of three or four. So there's a couple of fours and some threes. And I'm going to pop you in there for... Let's have a look. I'm going to pop you in there for just 15 minutes, just to have a quick chat. Um, I'm just going to set those up. Can you remind us, Andy, what the question is, what, we, what, what we're talking about, please? Yeah, absolutely. So what did you get from the process? From the dreamer stage, from the realist, from the critic? when it comes to thinking about the goal. What insights have you had already about achieving your goal or maybe a way of doing it? Uh, if I'm coaching somebody, obviously we're spending a lot of time at each stage drilling down into that bit of information. Like as I was checking in with Farzin and some of the others, you know, in terms of getting a tangible goal, if we're working one-to-one, -one, which I do a lot with my clients, then we would get a lot more information at each of the stages. But for you at the moment, just based on your own bit of self-coaching, what do you know now that you didn't know before? That's the question. Does that make sense? Good. I'm seeing a few nods. That's a good start. Uh, if you need help within the breakout spaces, there's an ask for help button in the corner. Press it and I'll suddenly appear. And I'll zip between. Uh, yeah, Diane, if you want to help each other within the group, then I would invite you to do that. Listen first though. And for those of you that maybe are already coaches, resist the urge to coach so that everybody gets a bit of chance to share first. And then maybe if there's one of you you want to just help within that. Yeah, definitely it's more about listening than solving within this. So resist, if you're a coach, sit on your hands, resist the urge to solve people's stuff. Um, and just allow them to just share what they found from the process. Because some of you may have done this process before and others might not. So I'm going to pop you into the rooms. So you're going to be in there 15 minutes. Uh, if you need help, just ask for help in the top corner. And I'll see you in a bit. So what kind of things did you discuss? I, I like this to be interactive, so hopefully you weren't just staring at each other for 15 minutes. So what kind of things did you discuss in the breakout spaces? What insights have you had so far? 
Hey, this is Aaron here. So hey, Aaron. I can say that it was interesting because all the three of us had more or less the same process that we are currently at. So it was interesting, mm -hmm. like how to expose ourselves online, you know, all the, the uh, what we want to do, but then like, you know, our fear of how people will react to this and what will be the strategy. So mm -hmm. we are kind of more or less on the same stage. So it was very interesting to, to just share each of us, how we kind of try to figure this, this way out. And it's so interesting, isn't it? Because what, what we perceive other people might say or do can stop us. Yeah. And before the ideas even get off the ground, we can let that stop us. But you are only making that stuff up in your head. You know, if you're anxious about something in the future, again, you're, you're anxious about something that you don't yet know that you've made up in your head that might happen. And so those things can really ground our dreams from getting going. But that's why it's really useful to step into each of the three spots, to be really creative and open, to be the planner, and to also be that critic. But so often, as I said earlier, we, get, we start with the critic. You know, or we start going to the planner too early, but we get lost because we're trying to plan forwards. And we, don't, you know, we, get, we get lost on the, on the route to getting there. Um, so that's where this process can be really, really useful when it comes to getting a bit creative about a project. And obviously with more time or with a um, piece of one-to-one -one work, it's the sort of things where you can then get really creative, actually spend a very long period of time doing this process. So typically if I'm working with a team, I'll be at least half a day going through this process with them. Not, it's not a 90 minute job. Um, I've done teams where I've worked on one session per each of the things. So we've got one session on Dreamer. You know, we've done one Zoom session you know, as the realist. We've done another session then as the um, critic. So people have the chance to be able to step into each, you know, wear these different hats. I don't know if anybody out there has heard of the six thinking hats. And this is very similar to the six thinking hat strategy, where you're basically putting that hat on and going, right, what am I thinking about from this point of view? Um, what else? Thanks, Aaron. Um, what else was sort of discussed in any of the rooms that anybody would like to share? I will share my learning. Um, Thanks, what I learned um, from this, from my, my review, is that I've, I focused a lot on what I needed to do and not so much on, I guess, who I need to become. Um, yep. So that was a that was a learning point for me from this from this cycle. And knowing that now, what difference has that made for you? Um, it's it's made me realise that um, you know striving to be you know the best version of myself f for this particular item here um, is actually a, a very important step and component of of the overall um, goal. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for me, so you can focus on, on the admin and the day-to-day -day and the things that you, you should do and actually miss a very crucial <laughs> um, item, which is yourself. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so that, that just kind of helped re refocus that it's, 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 it's more holistic than that. It's not just the tangibles, it's, it's you as the package. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The action and the admin and the and some of the steps are just part of the things that you have to do in order to get to that end result. And you also have to be the right version of yourself, or you have to step into an identity that maybe you're uncomfortable with. You know, some of you are talking about stepping into that identity of being a partner, or being an author, or being a coach, or being a whatever it is you need to step into in order to recognise that. But that's also why really connecting with the dream can be really important because when your dream is big enough you know, when you've really wanted to achieve something you just go and do it you don't let anything stop you, you just you just get on with it and so that's why the dream has to be big enough you know, what is that legacy piece what's going to happen because of all the people whose lives you influence or who read your things who get involved in your life or the kids you may have as a result of the relationship or not you know what are all the things that you're going to do within your community for yourself for the world that's going to make a difference and those are the things that end up becoming far bigger than just you and have that influence where you just get on with it. Nothing will stop you. Nothing credible will get in the way. You're just going to get on with it because it's far bigger than you now. And that's where that stuff can be really interesting, Nadine. And you just think in order for all of that to happen for you right now, 
you already know who you need to be and you are already it. The question for all of you, when you think about who do, who do I really need to be, and you can answer this one internally, is what's stopping me? What is stopping me from just stepping into those shoes right now? Because that's the interesting question. That's often the one that I'm working with with coaching clients is getting them through the what's stopping them. Because what's stopping you is you. Fundamentally, what stops me from being the best version of me is me. And the things I've been through and the past I've had and the things and decisions I've made in the past, I still beat myself up for. All of that stuff. Doesn't matter how much NLP you know. You know, there's always something to unlayer and, and get on with. I, I love this work. Every time I'm running a practitioner course and um, I was running one at, at the weekend. Um, also had Marva and uh, Michael with me assisting on it. Um, you know, every time I'm on a course, I'm running a course, I'm participating in it at the same time. It's always something to learn about yourself. It is a cyclical process. You do something, you get feedback. You do something, you get feedback. You don't do something, that's feedback. So therefore, what has been stopping you and what might still be stopping you right now from achieving what you want to achieve? It's getting out of paper format and into who you need to be. That makes sense, Nadine? Yeah, absolutely. Of course. Thank Any you. other feedback from those um, breakout groups? Um, one thing that was helpful for me was um, we focused on, like I have a goal in place and I fit, which is basically uh, running 5k and 10k in a decent time. Mm -hmm. And at the moment I can't even run 5k. So we were just talking about this and it was kind of well, a one, I guess, what is the bigger picture? You know, why do you want to do it? And then but two, it was also because I was talking about how I hit a bit of a plateau and it's just sort of trying to break it down. And maybe if you've got that step that you're, failing over try and break it up into smaller steps mm -hmm. and um how did you get on with that once you started to sort of consider that it was yeah no it was helpful actually so um because i've already i'm following an app so it already breaks it down into steps but it was just sort of i mean like now it seems really common sense but it takes some sometimes someone else to point it out to you that well just because somebody says that's one step, there's nothing to stop you breaking that down into however many steps you need to break it down into. So when you're running, who do you see yourself as? Um, I just, just as me, but I, I guess I would like to see myself as a fitter me, like somebody who's got better physical and mental stamina. Okay. And are you getting better each week? That's it. I keep, I'm hitting a plateau at the moment and I'm, I have an app that I'm following. I'm following the couch to 5k yeah. and both times I've got stuck on week four. Like I've never made it past week four. Like okay. I get to, I get, so I get better, I get better, I get to week four and then I, I end up sort of giving up because maybe work takes precedence, you know, something else takes precedence and then I feel like I can't, you know, I can't contribute the time and then I just and it's a bit I guess I'm just demotivated to do it so it's trying mm. to get past that so what will happen if you achieve your 5k goal um well if I achieve my 5k goal then I'll go on to 10k so I'll push it sort of further but the end goal of that is that just in sort of life work in general um I would like to achieve better physical and mental stamina Okay, so better physical and mental stamina. And to do that, you're going to do the 10K, 5K, yeah. and sort of work back through the Catch to 5K app. Um, and what will happen if you don't achieve that goal? Let's, take, so let's stick with the 5K. Let, what happens if you don't achieve the 5K goal? So I, this, this is a frustration. This is frustrating because I already have achieved the 5K goal. I did a 5K run last summer and I did it, but my time wasn't great. Uh, so it's not, about, like it's I, not about the running, though. It's about the time, is it? You told um, me you'd never achieved 5k earlier. Oh, sorry. Well, so I have achieved 5k, but it was in ah. a really poor time. And, but I've only done it like once. Like I've never managed to run it continuously since then. Okay. Who are you comparing yourself to? Like um, poor, in, poor in what way? Oh, um, just other people I know in general. So I do know quite a few people, but they're not beginner runners. They're all sort of, they're, they're, they're kind of at sort of half marathon, marathon type level. So um, I'm, but I'm, not, I'm not comparing myself against them. I mean, I'm just, you know, for instance, when I did the race, we had a list of times. So I could see that I was sort of, you know, in the lower, in, as in like the lower, you know, the lower 50% rather than the higher 50%. Sort of thing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's, in, it's interesting, isn't it? Because that, that comparison, whether or not you are or not, you, they came up. Um, mm -hmm. So I might suggest they might be there. And you're also comparing yourself to people who are far advanced in the process of learning. It's like comparing ourselves, mm, you know, with somebody who's, who's, you know, halfway through achieving it or on their way to a marathon when you're at the start. And it's not really a mm -hmm. fair comparison for your mind to make. Um, okay. And you are a runner because you can run. Whether or not it's the time you want to run, but that's perhaps your own competitive nature or your own... Mm um self-flagellation bit of maybe how you get motivated you know maybe by yeah. being disappointed with your time it gives you some motivation but sometimes it gives you so much demotivation that it ends up sort of winding down you get to that plateau so there's something there that's just a bit stuck at the moment yeah. that would actually be very easy to resolve i went through a similar process so i did a um uh triathlon um about five years ago now um, I've very similar. I'm not a runner, you know. I've done five k's and ten k's in the past, um, and I decided to go and do a triathlon. Don't recommend it for anybody. Um, and it was a sprint triathlon, so it wasn't it wasn't the biggies or anything, um, but it was big enough for me. Um, and I did this process, this outcome setting, the goal setting, and I and I remember my outcome and my goal was crossing the line, having achieved the um, the triathlon the crowd would be cheering you know my friends would be there clapping me on it'd be amazing i feel great i'd raise money for parkinson's mm -hmm. which my dad had and so it kind of had stuff that was kind of leaving a bit of a legacy as well and i really connected with that and, and again the problem with doing personal development and training is you have to commit so i i kind of come up with this goal on a practitioner course so now i was really committed because I'd, I'd committed in front of 20 people <laughs> um and um, so I, I got to the starting line of this triathlon. I did the swim. It took blooming ages. I was the, more, more or less the last person out of the water. And I did the cycle um, and did the run. Um, and I knew I was near the end of the run um, and near the back of the field because they were already packing up the water stations before I got near it. And I had the two St. John's ambulance bikes cycling with me at the end because there was nobody else left on the race. <laughs> um, and it was great because when I got to the end, they called out your name over the tannoy and, the, and everybody was cheering and clapping. I just thought, oh, wow, this is amazing. It was exactly like I'd visualised it to be. I remember turning around. Once I got to the other end, they give you a mug and a, and a medal. <laughs> that's it. That's yeah. what your achievement of spending a few hours um, out there on the course. And I turned around, looked to my left and realised that everybody was cheering because they were giving the medals out for prize winners. Um, I thought they were cheering for me. But it didn't <laughs> matter because that was part of my goal. And sometimes you just have to just know that it doesn't. you're only competing against yourself. Now, yes, you may want to get better. You're shaving a second off or a minute off. Or you're going an extra lamppost, whatever it is when you're getting started. And this is going for all of you. But you're starting to put these goals into fruition and you're going through the stepping stones. You're only ever against yourself. Now, yes, if you're inventing something or you're going to get something to market, yes, there might be some competition stuff going on there. But usually it isn't. It's just against what's going on in our own heads. And that's what you have to start to beat or manage or just... Get it out of the bloody way. And once you get that stuff, then it frees you up. It's so that you can get into your zone. I suspect there's times when you're running, we're not even thinking about times, you're just in the moment of flow. And if you can connect with that in the yeah. moment of flow, you enjoy running for running's sake, mm. not because the app's going in your head, going, you know, you're doing this in yeah. 20 seconds and that in the next stage and come on doing this bit. That's content. I would invite you perhaps sometimes to go out for a run without it, you know, just mm. enjoy being in the moment and being in the surroundings because you'll probably get a sense of the enjoyment from that process as well. Or maybe do, do some work with somebody to just help shift the mindset piece because once you shift the mind, the body will follow. And yeah. This is true so much in, the, in a lot of things. Just what you said about flow. That, I mean, I have had some good runs where, you know, I've managed to increase my time or, you know, as in decrease my time or increase the distance. And mm -hmm. that's, when I, that's when I've been in flow. But I can never... It's always been sort of random when it happens like I could you know I can't say oh I know you know like if I knew I'd eaten something in particular before that happened but I just mm -hmm. I can't I don't I don't know what's caused it so I had to get back in yeah uh, of, often for the because I, I my um one of my best mates is a fitness trainer and I've worked with some of his clients before often at the 5k level it's nothing about the food it's nothing about the water it's nothing about the mm. small stuff that's when you get into the you know, big triathlons and the, the yes. bigger stuff. That, that's when it's more important about stacking in the pasta and all of that stuff. You don't, you don't need a drink on a 5K. You don't need to bulk <laughs> up on rice the night sure. before. Yeah. It, it's all about the mental side of things, first of all. 
Um, and so shifting where the plateau gets to, and and again, you don't need to answer this one, but plateauing may be something that is a pattern, is you get so far in something, a goal mm -hmm. or achievement, and then you just flatline for a while. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not just running. It could be a career thing, or it could be a you know a relationship or a life thing, and all those kind of other other elements where it can come in. Is when that happens, that's just a natural pattern you're running. You've modelled it from somewhere. It's not your stuff. You've just learnt it as a behaviour. And all the things that we do is our patterns and our programmes. We model that from the people that we were raised with, from the people that we had in our lives, from the people that surround us. It's not your stuff. If you're choosing to not take that forward now, you have a choice. Sometimes you just have to decide to decide to let it go. Leave it in the past. It's like turning your baggage into luggage, letting go of some of the stuff that you're carrying around with you, shaking it out and actually freeing up some space mm. for what you'd like to have moving forward, isn't it? Okay, yeah, good stuff. No, I, I agree. Awesome. Elias, the mind shifts, the body follows. How do you shift the mind effectively? So that is a really good question. Um, yeah. And the answer to all really good questions, Elias, is it depends. Because um, <laughs> it depends on the person. It depends on the circumstances. But in NLP, we talk about the philosophy that the mind and the way that you take in and process information, the way you see the world affects your state. That state ends up affecting your physiology, your body. And the physiology then affects your behaviours. And when we have this cyclic loop where our behaviours end up with our reactions and then we notice the things that we've just done and we end up feeding that back into our thought processes and so forth. So you might see and hear something and go, wow, that's amazing and feel great. And your body's buzzing and alive. Or you might see something or it might trigger something in you, something negative, And then you suddenly feel, oh, and you feel it in your body. It's like a weight's being put on you. Yeah, it's like a drop in your own physiology. So often, even in things like running and, no, and conceptual stuff like that, if you're in a bad state of mind, your physiology will not be at its best. If you're choosing to process unconsciously information in a certain way or look at something or get demotivated because you've picked up your phone and seen everybody else's time, all those marathon runners who have gone in and done the 5K before you, you know, if you're looking at that kind of information before you go on your run, immediately your brain's already in its Ugh, state in order to run. You're not going to run at your best. You're not going to perform at your best. You're not going to write your book at your best. So it's about setting up your day to support you in that process and that flow. So a lot of the work um, that I do with people and teams and everything else is about setting up states and getting into flow. Um, and that's where things like the Disney strategy can be really, really useful. Um, just want to share one other part of that presentation with you uh, whilst I've got it up here. Um, <clears throat> so if any of you are in teams in a corporate environment, I've been doing a lot of facilitating on Zoom at the moment, for instance. Um, one of the processes that you can go through is this with teams. Now, um, one of the things to do if you are working this with teams, because I just thought I'd cover these key points. I know a number of people here work for different organisations. I've worked for the likes of Arcadia and Groupon and lots of other places where I'm brought in to run training or facilitate meetings for people. I mean, ensure that if you're doing this process from a meeting point of view, have a facilitator. Only focus on one aspect at a time. So only be the dreamer, only be the realist, only be the critic. And use your environment to switch. So you might have different flip charts in different areas of the room. <clears throat> Some places even have different rooms. Uh, the Imagineering team have different teams that work on this. One is the dreaming team, one is the realist team, the other one's the critic team that come up with all the earbuds. Be prepared for lots of information to come up, particularly at the dreaming stage. And then you start to get the chunks of information down. Um, don't take things personally. If you're working with a team and people are critiquing your idea, they are critiquing your idea. They're not talking about you personally, unless they're talking about you personally, in which case they are. Um, but generally when people are critiquing the idea, don't take it personally. So therefore, just chuck the idea into the pot. It's our idea, not my idea or your idea. And practice on small stuff before you build up on the major ones. Do your 5K before you do your half marathon. And absolutely key to all of this is having rapport and listening skills. You know, watch your butts. You know, if you're constantly coming up to somebody's idea, even at dream stage, you're going, yeah, but we can't do this. It will break rapport. You're not listening to somebody else. You're in your head disagreeing. So get into rapport with people and listen to them. So a top tip within Teams. Um, I did this with um, uh, an NHS trust that I was working with. So I was brought into this trust to basically run a session on stress and resilience because they'd had this merger with Barnett and Chase Farm um, and it, within the therapy services team, they weren't that happy. So what they thought they'd do is bring me in uh, to run a session on how to de-stress the team. 
And the reason the team were de-stressed is because nobody communicated with them about the merger properly from the team's point of view. And the managers were a bit peed off because they had communicated and none of the team had listened. So what we did by the time we got to first break was go, tell you what, let's, should, should we just postpone what I was going to do for the rest of this day and do this process? So what I did with them was I actually got all of them, and there about 30 of them in the room, is I got four different flip charts out and we took the team through the process. Right, as the outsider, what do we know about the merger of the team, number of sessions that we run between the two different locations, the number of, um, what's the patient satisfaction scores, what's all the, all the outsider information. Then move to a different spot in the room. Now, shake all that off, leave all that behind, get out all your yeah buts because we're gonna come to them later. Get, ignore the planning, all those planners out there and the project managers, right. What is it that you would love to have happen? Like when this has gone really well, what's it going to, difference going to make for you, for the patients, for the trust, for the way that you work together, for the difference it's going to make in the way you share skills and information, et cetera, et cetera. We got all those dreams out and we had about four um, big sheets of flip chart that lots and lots of information was written on. And then we moved forward with one of those and put it into action. So we then went to a different spot in the room and then went to realist. And the area they chose was communication. That was a big area they wanted to work on, that if it's at its best, was gonna work for that. And so then we worked on the communication. And what would that be like? How can they communicate better? And therefore, then when they went to critic, they would look at all the yeah buts. So the managers would go, yeah, but people don't read the emails or the newsletters. And so the team, because they were there, because the managers were with the team, then the team would go, okay, so we will read it if that's where you're putting the information, but we hadn't realized yeah, all we saw was the odd notice going up on the notice board. We just perceived the newsletter was the same. So once they've had the discussion in the room, we've got all the elephants out in the room, and we've kind of chucked them in the middle and squashed them. Then suddenly the team came together because they were on two different sites, working in two different locations, and we just chucked into one big pot. And that's why it hadn't gone so well. So going through this process as the whole team was really, really effective when it came to facilitating and collaborating. So if you've ever got things to do with collaborating, I highly suggest going through this kind of process with them so everybody gets their ideas out and it feels like the team has made a decision rather than the decisions being put upon somebody or isn't being influenced by another section. So it's very useful. This even works with suppliers and stakeholders, clients, um, you know, different uh, organizations that you're collaborating with. Even more important in the situation that we're in at the moment, where you've got loads of stuff going on with lots of different people, to get them into one room, even if it's a virtual room like this, to have these kind of meetings where people can really collaborate. But I always suggest you get a facilitator in to do that because they are unemotionally attached to the outcome and can then really make a big difference with that. If you're self-coaching with this technique, which we've kind of already gone through today, I would suggest using different spaces, move, sit, stand in different spaces for each of the areas. Um, ensure that you're only focused on the one aspect again and know that you're going to come to the realist and the critic later when you're in the dreamer so dream really big and um, have fun with it it is a fun creative process um, and it works for outcomes goals it also works for problems you know, major life changes big things you'd like to have happen um, and I use this technique a lot when I'm coaching clients I've got other stuff that I now use when it comes to right, connecting with goals I'm a goal mapping practitioner I do a lot of work with helping people set really good goals on how they're going to get there and then I use things like Disney technique within that to go right how can I realistically get to those problems and what are all the critical elements that might come in. Um, as I said on there if you want to know more get a copy of this video and the ebook that I've got on like a one pager on the Disney process if you haven't already drop your email into the private chat um, if you want to know more about using it with teams or self-coaching or if you want to know more about coaching in general um, I'd even want to know a bit more about NLP training and um, different elements that uh, I offer as well. You know, if you're interested in this kind of work, and I run these sessions um, in this kind of environment now, we've gone virtual, uh, like everybody else. Uh, if you're interested in this kind of work, we meet on the second Monday of every month, typically, um, holidays allowing. But if you're in the meetup group or um, you give me your email details, I'll pop you on so that you know um, the uh, when these sessions are coming up. And generally, I try and pre-plan and let people know when they are, but otherwise, um, I don't necessarily know them always. In um, I try and, try and get them out in, in advance as I can, let's put it that way. But before we finish, has anybody got any questions, anything they would like to ask or share? Buzzing? Yes, yeah. <laughs> 
I'm kind of waiting so I don't want to ask too much and sort of share the stage. But um, yeah, I suppose one one challenge I have is that um, very improvement orientated. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was just wondering, sort of, I, I see the trap in that a little bit. It's like, I just want to improve. I want to improve. And I'm maybe too focused on that. Have, have you ever had an experience that yourself or people you've worked with and do you know what I mean by the sort of negative effects of just trying to improve and not being satisf- satisfied with, with, you know, what is, what you have and, and stuff. How is that a problem for you? Good question. Um, I'm always thinking into the future of like, I'll improve this, improve this, improve this. Do you ever achieve it in the now? Say that again? Do you ever achieve it in the now? You Are you always thinking about the future? Always thinking about the future. So some people are very future focused. They live in the future. They're always thinking about what's next. You probably have packed your bag for what you're going to do tomorrow. You've already got everything planned. You've got everything written out in your diary. I'm a future planner. So I've got a whole load of stuff out there that gives me a little bit about what's coming up next. You know, I'm a future based person, but if I forget about that, I forget to live in the now. So I can be about what's next, but I'm missing the moment. Remember you, what you wanted was peace now. <laughs> yeah. This could be one of the reasons why you're missing it. <laughs> you're focusing on how you're going to get your peace tomorrow and not your peace today. Yeah. So it is possible to change what we call the meta programs from an NLP perspective where you are that kind of focuser. But yes, is it okay to keep wanting to improve? Definitely. But if you're only ever wanting to improve and never acknowledging how you far you've got, uh, then it's going to be really tricky for you. So, yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Brilliant. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I have a quick question. Yep. Like uh, the focus, is that a logical process to follow? You always start with a dreamer and then you, uh, you go to the next stage and then the third and then the fourth one. Is that logical? Sorry, say that again, Elias. Is that, is that a logical uh, step to follow? Like you, the first, you always start with the dreamer. Yes. And, yeah. yeah, so we start with the outsider then go to the dreamer, then the realist, and then the critic, yeah? Because if you go to the dreamer, you get all the big dream conceptual stuff, right? If you then go to the realist, you start to plan that down and get it into a bit of a framework. And then the critic is being critical about the thing you're planning, not about the dream or the big idea. That's the idea. Focus the critic on the timeline of what you've come up with as a plan. Because if you go from your goal and then you go straight into critic, You'll be critical about the idea. It will never go anywhere, which is perhaps where you already are. If you go straight to realist, you'll start trying to plan something, but you never really connect as to why it's important to you and what you're going to get when you get there. So you're not going to be that motivated to achieve it. So that's why it's best to start with a dreamer, then go to the realist, and then go to the critic. The other reason we're doing this is this is also the process that Walt went through. So this was the model that came out of Dilts um, studying Walt Disney. Okay. Um, in the ebook, I'll also uh, give you reference to the, the book, which is basically Robert Diltz's source material. For any of you that are NLPers, um, there's a, um, a book which he wrote around the study that he had of, I think it's four particular people that he studied about their creativity and their genius. Um, so the ebook will have that bit of information in as well. Um, how could I work um, one-on-one with you, Angie? And how much do you charge, please? Oh, loads, Gina. Depends. <laughs> Um, so it, the answer is to that, it depends. Um, for some people, I work in blocks. So they want to book you know, a block of time and session uh, time and that kind of stuff. Uh, for other people, they want one-off sessions. So typically, at the moment, over Zoom, I charge £75 an hour. My first mm-hmm. session is always two hours long because I need to get to know you. Um, and thereafter, people can either block book um, hours of time, which means that they then get a cheaper hourly rate or they can just book ad hoc sessions. So there you go, up front. That's my session costs at the moment over Zoom. It's okay. more if I have to travel. Um, it's more if it's you know evenings in London, but all of that stuff doesn't happen at the moment anyway. So over Zoom, 75 pound an hour. Um, and uh, yeah, first session is always an hour long, but there's no commitment. I'm not signing up to a coaching program or a package or any of those kind of things. Um, and if you want to learn about NLP, um, then that training is around about £1,500 if you want to come and do the training in NLP. Um, mm-hmm. uh, if you want to become a practitioner of NLP, 
um, the master of practitioners around about three and a half thousand just so you know in your head what the levels of pricing is hmm. if i was to train as um, an nlp uh, mm -hmm. thing um practitioner um uh, how much again was that please 100 and 1000 and so the practitioner course is around about 1500 pounds all oh, right 1500 pounds yeah. um you know can that um help people heal from trauma say uh, it can um i would always suggest that you go through a process with if, particularly if you have trauma um mm. you've gone through a process to make sure that you've resolved the things that you need to resolve so if it's um I'm a coach, I'm not a therapist. So if somebody comes to me and they need psychotherapy, I will refer them to a psychotherapist. If they then go through that process or they've been with a counselor or they've resolved the trauma, then the course is not a replacement for trauma therapy. Okay. Um, the course will help you day-to-day -day coach and resolve a lot of stuff that maybe you don't even recognize is there. We all carry, we all carry stuff with us. Mm. Um, but the course is not a replacement for a good counselor or a psychotherapist. Um, but the course will help you no matter where you are on whichever area that you want to work on. Yeah, but we I, always... I mean, for me, I mean, once I'm trained, you know, can I then yeah. yes. help people? That's, that yes. was my question. Yes. yes, it wasn't about me particularly. Okay, but cool. Think... Yes. Yeah. So therefore, um, the practitioner gives you the ability to work with other people. Yeah. Yes. And I can From... help heal their trauma. Uh, again, if you're dealing with trauma, then I would suggest that you do uh, NLP training plus psychotherapy training or plus trauma training or plus PTSD training or plus whatever is the area that you want to go into. So there's lots of different slants that so you can add NLP into something um, like your, if you're already coaching and managing, you know, different coaching techniques and you can add NLP to that. Um, we have a lot of psychologists that come and do the course. We have a lot of people who are psychotherapists who come and do the NLP course who want to add the NLP to what they already know. But if you're doing coaching around trauma, then get proper trauma training. And that takes years, not a shortened version of a course. Whereas if you're learning NLP from a coaching point of view, then we can deliver all the aspects that you need to be able to start to work one-to-one -one people. But then it is down to you to put the hours into practice. Um, mm. And we do that with a practitioner course over a period of weekends rather than a period of years. But if you're specifically dealing with trauma, please get proper trauma training. Right. So <clears throat> would any of your sessions help with trauma, say, on a yeah uh, yes but again it depends on the specifics of the person or the individual or you know where they are what the trauma is it depends on what how people label trauma and so forth have i worked with people yes um have i also signposted to people because it's beyond my extent of knowledge that i'm feel that i can work with them safely yes so it uh, we would need to have a separate conversation with Regina. yeah okay all right so yeah. well i've sent my email address anyway Perfect. Yeah, so um, if you would like a copy of the slides and the video and the ebook, um, once I've edited out the plant arriving and whatever else is happening back there, um, then I will get you. What is happening back there? Why was there police in your house? I don't know. I'll find out in a bit. <laughs> um, uh, then I will make sure that I get you a copy of everything across just via the email address. Okay. All right. And if I reply to that email, um, you might be able to um, maybe point me in a direction. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm more than happy to have a one-to-one -one call with anybody if you're interested in stuff. Again, yes, this, isn't, this, is not, this is not a big pitch, but this is just what else that we do or I do mm -hmm. um, outside of all of this. But if, you, if you're finding that you've got something that's been stopping you, um, you know, an hour or two of session can be really, really useful when it's yes. tailored to you because it's your stuff. Tools. Whoever tools. You are. tools. Absolutely. Definitely yes, tools. Yes, and that's where, what I'm thinking of with NLP. It's a tool and, you know. It is. A, it, yeah. It's like a multi-fix yeah. screwdriver come occasional hammer um and also uh polyfiller <laughs> well there you are combining there you one are. did i hear you say earlier that you you offer a free call or something nope nope that wasn't you okay <laughs> all right no i've got two free calls today with people <laughs> I, I, I won't have a quick chat with anybody but <laughs> but, uh, but i don't do free sessions all right I value I'll, my time. <laughs> I'll reply to your email this is this is the free bit gina <laughs> i know i'll reply to your email andy Thank you. Oh, you've no been worries. amazing, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, any other questions before we finish and I find out what's happening in my kitchen? Yes. Uh, very quick question uh, regarding the mind shifting. Is it uh, uh, control 
And if that is the case, um, what a simple way of uh, like uh, getting into state or something like that. So Elias, I asked you when it said if it's regarding and then it cut out. So what, can you just re say the question again, please? Is it basically mind shift? Is it state control? And if so, so yeah, if so, is there any easy to... So your internet connection is really bad. I got some of that question, but basically you said is mindset state control. Um, yes, is mind sh uh, shift. Uh, uh, yeah. So yeah. you can change your mind by changing your mind by thinking different thoughts that changes your state. You can get into a high performance state and that will change your mind and shift something. You can change your physiology that changes your mindset. You can breathe in a different way and you change your mindset. You behave in a different way and that changes your mindset. You are an interconnected system. What your head, heart, body does shifts your mindset. You're doing it anyway. NLP isn't magic. You're already doing NLP. Uh, what coming on the course gives you is the ability to do it when you want to. Um, so when it comes to shifting and changing your mind, you are already doing it. But when it comes to wanting to do it, that's when the knowing why you're not, what's stopping you from making the big shift, which is what I'm guessing you're asking about, not the small stuff, the big one, that is then a process of finding out what's been stopping you. So yes, it can, and also everything else can as well. You know, dancing around will shift your mind, but it might not permanently stay that way. Whereas reprogramming your mind, definitely. 